zooming out of the past into the present. When the Lord calls you and gives you revelation, how wonderful that is, but you also are now at a higher level of responsibility. Amen, <laughs> and that people that may have never be, been given that, but they can kind of glean off of your tree, but you can destroy that testimony. Ugh. And it could be really bad. Maybe people who could have been saved aren't because our testimony isn't what it should be. So it's, it's not playing around. These are important things. A gifted man, a gifted pastor that really is able to, you know, communicate and communicate truth and can really get in before God and get something good for a, for a congregation and for people but then he goes out and makes a mistake in his life. And all his gifts are still there, yes. but it's hard for the people to receive from him anymore. See? So all these kinds of things were already going on there, and the Lord wouldn't retract his gifts from the man's life, same as he would not retract the calling upon Israel, no matter how <laughs> bad of an example they were, he chose them for that. They have to do it. And they might do a good job or a bad job, but he's not going to give the job to someone else. They are the carriers of this oracle. So that even happened with Abraham. Remember when he, uh, he brought his pretty wife into the, in, uh, a country where the king liked to collect pretty wives? And the king of Gerar, and he said, tell her, you're my sister. And so she does. And then he marries her. And then the Lord comes into him a dream and says, you're a dead man because how's Abraham's testimony in all this? He lies. He makes his wife lie. <laughs> the king takes her and is about to take her as wife. And then Abraham's God comes and witnesses to the king and says, you're about to sin and I'm going to destroy you. You need to go back to Abraham and have him pray for you and have sacrifice. Wait, what, what, what? He's the one that caused all this. And the Lord says, he is my prophet. Have him go pray for you. Hmm. Wow. The gifts and callings of God are without repentance. Even when the man that has the gift really botches it up bad. <laughs> But God doesn't change the fact that the gift is in that person. So Israel had many problems. They had all these things that we see that they were judged for, but they also had true prophets. Amen. And those prophets were carriers of the oracles of God. And yes, Edom, Moab, Ammon, sorry, but that's the way it is. Yeah. There are true prophets in Israel, and they have the truth, and you have to submit. The older shall serve the younger. There is a, sub, there is a spiritual submission that had to happen, Amen. not just a natural one. They had to submit spiritually to Israel. Well, they didn't most of the time. Some individuals did, but as nations, they didn't. They just couldn't stand that, and idol worship seemed a lot more attractive than submitting to a bunch of hypocrites. And it turned into the whole history of the Old Testament where we have all the wars that happened through the books of Kings and Chronicles. So Israel is partly responsible for that just because their testimony was bad. But here's what's really interesting to me. All through the Bible, it's in Isaiah, it's in Jeremiah, it's in Ezekiel, they are sending prophecies to these other nations they're not just prophesying to Israel. They're sending a message to Edom. They're sending a message to Moab. They're sending a message to all these places around. And those were true prophecies. And a lot of them were uh, warnings that they had to change their behavior. Just like they were giving warnings to Israel, they're giving warnings. Now, here's one of the things that you know that the Lord is striving. He doesn't strive with people who can't be saved. Yes. 
And I'm going to show you some examples in the Bible where he is striving with these other nations. It's not that they're elected and predestinated to hell and they can't be saved, or he wouldn't be wasting that, all that effort to reach out to them. So they're getting messages, they're getting oracles from God. And we're going to look at something, uh, and one of them is in the message. It's just a beautiful one that, that Brother Branham brought out. They did have their own prophets. But it seems like somehow they knew that those Israelite prophets had something <laughs> that their own prophets didn't have. And sometimes they would reach out and they'd say, well, what's the, what's the Israeli prophet saying? You know. Well, they might not like it, but they kind of had re <laughs> respect for it. So here's some of the lessons for us. How should brothers teach each other, treat each other? Well, Jacob and Esau were brothers, and all their descendants were considered brothers. And they were supposed to have a relationship that God set up. So there's some lessons to us in this history about how to treat your brothers and sisters. And even the ones that maybe aren't in the same state of revelation as you. But how that, that treatment should go. So that's all through the Old Testament. And I think it would be worth it to us to examine some of those. How does the Lord want us to do this? Anyone hear of the message, Watchman, what of the night? Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay, that's a great. He preached it a couple of times. Yeah. And he also mentions the, that scripture a lot of times in other messages. That that's not the title of it. That's something he always goes back to. That is a prophecy from Isaiah to the Edomites. Watchman, what of the night? That's the context of it. And so he takes an application of that and, and makes it to our time. But it's one of those cases where the Lord is reaching out yes. to Esau before they had crossed the line. See, in Malachi, they'd crossed the line. So this is before. They still have a chance to turn this around. And so he's, he's crying out through, through Isaiah. Oh my, I skipped this one completely. Um, just briefly, we'll slow down, Brother Josiah. Slow down. I just wanted to show you, because I made the statement, that this is the scripture here um, where the Lord talks about the promised lands to the other nations. So this is from Deuteronomy 2. And the Lord spake unto me, saying, You have compassed this mountain long enough, turn you northward. And commanded thou the people, saying, You are to pass through the coast of your brethren, the children of Esau. He calls them your brethren, which dwell in Seir, and they shall be afraid of you. Mm. Take good heed to unto yourselves, therefore. Meddle not with them, for I will not give you of their land. No, not so much as a footbreadth, because I have given Mount Seir unto Esau for a possession. So that's their promised land that God Amen. gave them. Amen. Okay, so skipping down to verse 9, and the Lord said unto me, Distress not the Moabite and the Ammonite also, which is the children of Lot, neither contend with them in battle, for I will not give thee of their land for a possession. So they were already up there in their land, yeah. because I have given Ar unto the children of Lot for a possession. So that's their promised land. And what did they do? This is just interesting couple little verses here. The Emims dwelt there in times past. Oh, that's the giants. A great people, many and tall as the Amakim. So that's the people that were up there, which were also accounted giants as the Anakims, but the Moabites call them Emons. And the Horims also dwelt in Seir, Mount Seir. That's Edom's area. It's also called Mount Seir. But the children of Esau succeeded them when they had destroyed them from before them. Isn't that amazing? They went up yes. there and destroyed the giants in the name of the Lord. They went up and did it. Mm. And dwelt in their stead as Israel did unto the land of his possession, which the Lord gave unto them. So that's one of the places where we see those promised lands and that commission given to them. 
So Edom has to be in the program of God at a different level, but they aren't totally, you know, outside of any of God's favor. He's given them a job to do and they go do it. Yes. So they're not lost at this point. They still have a chance. Watchman, what of the night? So there's the, the two messages. You can listen to them. They're, they're very good. They're interesting. And he is comparing um, the situation there to our time where a prophet is sent to give a message to the people and they don't really want to hear it. So that's the situation. And he's saying, well, that's kind of like what's going on now <laughs> in this ministry. And the watchman is giving the message and the people don't want to hear it. So that was just a prime example of that in Isaiah uh, 21. So you can listen to those two and see how he makes those comparisons to our time. But we're going to get a little more into what was going on at the time. This is from God Keeps His Word. So there's a watchman up there, and he, he talks about how the watchman has to be up on a tower so they can see the enemy coming. Yeah. And he says here, and the Bible says, watchman, what of the night? And if the watchman sees the enemy coming and fails to warn the people, God said he would require their blood at the watchman's hand. Yeah. So that's on him if he doesn't say anything. But if the watchman warns them, then the watchman is free. Yeah. If the people are destroyed, then it's on them. So when the Lord sends a prophet, he's a watchman. He can see farther. He has special sight. God equips him with special sight. He can see the dangers out there and equip the people. And once they hear that, then the watchman is off the hook. He's done his responsibility. Now if they're destroyed, it's on them. And then he goes and says, so I must warn. <laughs> and among our Protestant brethren, I have noticed many times, and he goes on, how he has this commission that he has to do. So a prophet is a watchman. Yeah. Now, what of the night? What that kind of like is saying, and uh, you can get out Isaiah 21. Maybe we'll, we'll look at this in a minute. But what of the night is kind of like saying, Watchman, what time is it? Yes. How much of the night is left? What of the night? And nighttime in that situation is like the frightening time of danger. Yes. Night is dangerous. That's what an enemy could sneak up in the night. And if you could just get to the daytime. So they're saying, what of the night? How much night is left? Is it this morning coming soon? You know, we're going to get out of this darkness. Um, and the very interesting answer was morning comes and also the night. Amen. Wow. Well, the Old Testament prophets were, were masters at, at poetry and at double meanings, and there's multiple meanings in that uh, morning comes and also the night. But it meant something pretty specific to the Edomites at that time. So let's see, do we have that, uh, Isaiah 21? Yes. Okay. I wonder if I made a slide for it. I might have. Yeah, I did. Okay. <laughs> Just to save time, we won't read through it a verse at a time, but we'll just look at it. And just personally, for me, Isaiah, even through the language, the difference in language and culture and everything, I can feel the poetry in Isaiah. He was just a master poet. A lot of it just goes over our head, but the burden of the desert of the sea. As whirlwinds in the south pass through, so it cometh from the desert, from a terrible land. A grievous vision is declared to me. The treacherous dealer dealeth treacherously, and the spoiler 
Spoileth. <laughs> well, that happened when Edom made an alliance with Babylon to attack Jerusalem and the treachery was turned back on them. So that was fulfilled. That was a case of that. The treacherous dealer made a deal and turned back on it and dealt treacherously. And the spoiler, spoileth. Hmm. So they went to spoil and they ended up being spoiled. Go up a lamb, besiege, O media, all the sighting thereof I have made decease. Where are these places? I'll show you a map later. It'll all make sense. Elam and Media. Therefore, my loins filled with pain, pangs have taken hold of me as the pangs of a woman that travaileth. I was bowed down at the hearing of it. I was dismayed at the seeing of it. My heart panted. Fearfulness affrighted me. The night of my pleasure hath turned into fear unto me. Wow, whatever this is, it's pretty bad. I was telling you, this scared me out of my socks when I saw this, basically. Prepare the table, watch in the watchtower, eat, drink, arise, ye princes, and anoint the shield, for thus hath the Lord said unto me, Go set a watchman, let him declare what he seeth. Okay, and what did he see? And he saw a chariot with a couple of horsemen, a chariot of asses and a chariot of camels. And he hearkened diligently with much heed, and he cried, a lion, my lord, I stand continually upon the watchtower in the daytime, and I am set in my ward whole nights. Any, everybody following this? Yes. Okay, good. And behold, here cometh a chariot of men with a couple of horsemen. And he answered and said, Babylon is fallen, is fallen, and all the graven images of her gods he hath broken unto the ground. O oh, my threshing and the corn of my floor, that which I have heard of the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, have I declared unto you. The burden of Duma. All right, Duma, I'll just insert this here, is a play on words of Edom, kind of spelt backwards. It takes one letter from the back and puts it to the front to make the word that they use for the nation of Edom mean the silence of the dead, which is what Duma means. So he's saying the burden of those who are as good as dead, basically. In other words, you're toast. So this is not a good warning that's coming, but he's doing it in such an elegant Isaiah kind of a way. <laughs> You know, the burden of you who are toast in American, you know, <laughs> and he calleth out to me out of Seir. Now, where's Mount Seir? That's Edom's territory, right? Mm -hmm. So now they're calling up to the Israelite prophet. They want an answer. Why? Because there's a huge army that's been coming down, destroying everything in its path. And nations a lot bigger than them are getting wiped out. And so they got to the point where we've heard what our prophets want to say, but now we want to hear what the Israelite prophet is going to say about this. So they call out, Watchman, what of the night? Watchman, what of the night? And the watchman said, The morning cometh, and also the night. If ye will inquire, inquire ye. Return, come. Okay. Now, this sounds really clumsy in English, this inquire and inquire ye. But what they're kind of doing is they're using the prophet kind of like a fortune teller, not so that they can repent and change their ways, but so that they know what is coming so that they can... Uh, take measures themselves to get out of it. So what's kind of going on here, he says, if you're going to inquire, also repent. That's what this return and come means. If you're going to ask me the truth, he said, I know what you're after. You don't want to repent. You want, you want me to tell you when the army's coming, how big it's going to be so you can escape. 
but you're not going to escape unless you repent because it's because of your sin that the army's coming to begin with. So he's actually kind of calling them out with that. And they're saying, what of the night? Well, yes, the morning is coming, but also the night. So there were two great waves of armies that came through. The first one was Assyria, and that was in the time of Isaiah. And they came all the way through. Let me see if I have a slide for it. I might. Yeah, okay. I'll back up for those two. So Assyria is up here, okay? And Babylon is down here. The first thing they did, and by the way, Assyria and Babylon were kind of brothers too. They're related kingdoms. They have the same language, same, king, same religion, but they're always fighting each other. And they went back and forth all the time. Who's on top? So where is Edom is down here, okay? So, and Assyria is getting stronger and stronger. And so they, they go across and they make an alliance with Babylon. So they want Babylon on their side. Now that scripture we just read, it said Babylon is fallen. So the two or three horsemen and the camels come and they tell them Babylon is fallen. Uh-oh, they had just thrown in their stock with Babylon. So that's what the watchmen saw. They're coming with some bad news because now they threw their stock in with Babylon. Assyria went down, wiped out Babylon, and now they're coming around this way. <laughs> So they're coming down from the north. And when they come through Israel, that's where the northern tribes lose their whole kingdom. So they're totally wiped out. So they go into captivity under Assyria. And they're still coming down and they run into Jerusalem. And that's an amazing story that Isaiah tells about when the Assyrian army comes down. And we might go into that sometime. But they end up getting most everything else, but they can't get Jerusalem. The Lord protects them, and Isaiah is in the city with the king. So this is the big threat of the time. And they're saying, Watchmen, what of the night? Is this going to happen? Are they going to take us over? <clears throat> well, he does. But then after that, through their history, they get another chance. So they get a morning, and then they get a night, and I type that to the first death and the second death. Because in the first death, they're uh, sacked by Assyria, but they get their nation back. But in the second death, they're sacked by Babylon, and we read what happens in Malachi, they lose everything. So the night comes, the night ends, a morning comes, but then the final night, and they end up losing their entire nation. That's what we just read about. The morning comes, and also the night. So that's one of the things it means. <laughs> and one of the double meanings is, some people get a morning and others get a night. So Israel, Jerusalem got spared. They got a morning, but the night also came for other people. So they were wiped out. So that's the politics of the time, and that was what their question was. So they believed. They were a very proud people, and they had a geography that made them believe that they could always escape, because they had all these cliffs, mountains, territories like that, and they knew the trails and the pathways and armies can't march up there very well. So this is the area where Edom is. So they always had in the back of their mind, if we know when they're coming, they won't be able to follow us up there. And we'll get away and we'll escape. So they're relying on their geography. And it was, the, it was a wilderness. Beyond that, it was a desert. It was very dry. And they would live off the land like Esau did, hunting and maybe a little bit of farming animals, but not growing crops. So they kind of thought that we can, we can manage this. We can get away. I mean, everybody else will be rolled over by this bulldozer that's coming. 
that we can get away. So they had that kind of an attitude. And the, another attitude they have, and this is going to get called out by the prophets too, is why is it, Esau, that whenever the pressure comes down, you're always siding with the enemy against Israel? Why is that? <clears throat> Whoever the big you know, army is, if it's Egypt, you're siding with Egypt. If it's Assyria, you're siding with Assyria. If it's, if it's Babylon, you're siding with Babylon. Why are you always siding against the one that I prophesied that you are supposed to serve and help Israel to prosper, and as they prosper, you prosper? Why are you always trying to flip the script? Why are they always making secret deals on the side? Mm. And not just once, over and over and over again. Now, this is what is happening in the 1,600 years of history. It wasn't just a one-off thing. The Lord had tremendous patience with this nation. Tremendous patience. And over and over again, they're always trying to work a little deal on the side. So when you conquer Israel, we'll get to conquer them too. It was always in their heart. Hmm. Wonder if that could happen today. It could even happen in churches. You know, there could be people who sit in a church for a long time, but back in the back of their mind, I'm not content with this. I don't like this ministry. I don't like this song leader. Whatever it is. And they're waiting for a chance that if ever that ministry has a little bit of a weakness, mm -hmm. they're ready to jump on it and try and flip the script. Mm -hmm. You know what the Bible teaches? Mm -hmm. The Lord hates that. Mm -hmm. The Lord hates that. That's one of the lessons that's in this whole scenario, to have a secret agenda. If you're going to support it, support it. If you're going to be against it, go somewhere else. But don't sit there right in the background always looking for an angle that you can kind of change the situation. Oh, it happens in churches. We call it church politics. But the Lord doesn't like that. You know, he likes people that are going to be true, you know. And if there's a problem, get in there and work it out. But don't have all these little secret things going on <laughs> in the background, trying to needle this way or that way and get things to be the way you would like it. That is a characteristic of the Edomites. And they were meant, they were called, they had a much higher calling than that. But they fell way short of it. So, so still today, yeah. they've got under the roof. Yes. The original prophecy was the elder would serve the younger, not that they would be destroyed. Right. So they could still be operating under that. Yes, absolutely. Right. But they would, they would not um, submit to that. Oh, man. So... And that's why they're not on the map today. But that's a picture, and I got this one here. Let's see. Okay, this is from, from Google Earth. So I just took this today off of Google Earth. So their geography was nobody can get us. So here they are right in the middle here. And so they've got all these cliffs to the east here. And they've got these buffers around them. We've got Israel to the north, so they're a buffer. We've got Egypt over here. To the west and they're a buffer on the other side there's the Arabian desert that is hardly passable by armies so they had this this false confidence that even if we don't obey those prophets and even if everybody else can't <laughs> gets taken over we'll get away so that was the attitude they that they had now um if you want to read about how this all happened, I won't do it tonight. But when the Assyrian conqueror came down, it's in Isaiah chapter 36. 
and 37. And uh, you can see how that battle went, but we're just doing an overview now because we're gonna get a few more lessons about why it is that the Lord had to end up with this judgment on Esau in the end. Another cross-reference you wanna look at is the entire book of Obadiah. And you wanna know what the book of Obadiah is about? It's another Israelite prophet calling out Edom for siding with the enemy. Still striving with them. Now, what's the difference? So they both got taken over, right? By Babylon. They both went into captivity. We just went through it. <laughs> when Israel came back and started to rebuild. What a great time to finally get it right, Edom. Here's your chance. You've both been taken over. And which side do we find them on? In the time of Ezra and Nehemiah. Mm. After all that, they're siding with the enemies again. Israel's being restored. They can get in on the blessing. And they adjoin all those forces that are opposing the temple, opposing the wall, playing politics. And that's when the Lord says, enough. And that's where we get these verses that we just read out of Malachi. Mm. They're going to go rebuild their own way after all this. They're going to rebuild their own cities and still try to oppose Israel when all this blessing is going on. <laughs> okay, the Lord has a lot of patience, but there, <laughs> yeah. there comes a time right. when they've all been punished, they've all been spanked. Now let's start over fresh. The first thing they do is jump on the other side. Yeah. Destroy that opportunity. Instead of coming on Instead of supporting and, that. Yeah. yeah. Instead of Cain coming to Abel and saying, teach me what you are doing so I can do it also. Right. Yeah. He wanted to destroy that. Yeah. yeah. And when Israel came back, they came back with repentance. Right? And they had those big meetings and those prayers. Right. And they were, okay, we need to do this right now. And, um, and Ezra was teaching the people. And they're like, okay, our father sinned. We're going to try and straighten this out. After all this, Edom, <laughs> they didn't want any bit of that. So really what happened was they, they crossed the line. You know, if after all that, you're not going to change as a nation, there's an element in that nation. Now, I believe individual Edomites joined Israel and were part of it you know, as individuals. But that nation, they just had that ancient <coughs> hatred. You know, some, one of the things that we can learn is really pay attention to the, when the Lord is blessing something, even if it's not what you expected him to bless. Yes. But don't find yourself on the other side. Yes. Say, okay, the Lord is blessing it. I didn't, don't know, wasn't expecting this. I didn't know how this was going to all happen. Yes. But he's blessing it. If you oppose that, you're tiptoeing pretty close to an Esau-type attitude that the Lord really doesn't like. And the verse we read, what did he say? So the whole world will see. Let's see, I think it was verse 5. Um, Malachi 1, verse 5. And your eyes shall see. So this should be, he's saying this should be obvious for everyone. Your eyes shall see and ye shall say, the Lord will be magnified from the border of Israel. So in just natural sight, the Edomite nation should have been able to say, okay, we've seen 
this before. Jehovah is, whatever they're doing, Jehovah's blessing. How do they build that wall in 52 days? They can't do that. <laughs> you know, they don't have those kinds of skills. But even after all that. So the Lord's hatred is not for no reason. There's always reasons. And there's a space for everyone before you get to that point individually no one goes to hell without the Lord reaching out to them and giving them every chance so that's on the individual level a space to repent yes now if you just pick up this one verse like the critics of the Bible and say oh look God's hateful well you better look at the whole story here yeah, look at the whole story. These people were going to be in a thorn in the flesh of Israel. They were going to make it hard for them. They're going to continue to oppose everything they try to do. And it's going to go on and on and on. It's never going to stop. <clears throat> so the Lord's going to stop it. Because they're choosing not to change. Choosing. Yeah. Not because he ordained them no, to do that. They're choosing that. They're choosing that. Yeah. And so he, he gives them the, the fruit of their choice. Yeah. So, so we have a modern day church that sits on seven hills. Um, <laughs> oh my. It's <laughs> down, you know, and uh, along comes a humble prophet with the restoring, restoring message. Gifts start coming back, and, and it's following the same pattern. Where the, the elder church, the Church of Rome, wouldn't. Didn't want to submit. Didn't want to come. Wow. Well, to Branham, wow. And they say, how, how shall we do it? We clearly see there's some blessing of the Lord here. How do we not see this? <laughs> you know, but isn't isn't every denomination kind of like that? Yeah. Because a new light, a new revival comes, <clears throat> and they sit back and oppose it. And they look at their setup, their cliffs, and their 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 halls of learning, and their doctrine, and their history, and they say, oh, we're safe here. Yeah. Our yeah. Yeah. And that was interesting what you said about the burden of the map. You said it was the burden of the silence of the dead. Silence, yeah. And the kind of the implication is it's the silence of death. And it's like, you know, Brother Brandon preached a message of condemnation to, to the United States. Yes, yeah. he did. And his message was like a burden. It was like an indictment, right? Yeah, yeah. judgment, right? Against the yeah. United States and the, you know, the denomination. Like mm -hmm. And even like him saying, the morning cometh. So like the bride, there will be a morning. Mm -hmm. And then... The tribulation. The right. Yes. The tribulation. Yes. Mm, mm -hmm. The morning comes to Israel. The night comes to Edom. The morning comes to the bride. The night comes to that system that was rejecting. Yeah. Now, I'm working really hard to bring these lofty things down to our practical, but, you know, I really just wanted to show this is a span, a message that spans the whole Old Testament. So it's not a minor, it's a, it's a big one, you know. And uh, it's all around us. It's in our own little situation. But it's also, we can look out over, like you said, the church world and the denominational world. All those spirits are still out there. Yeah. And if you're just humble like enough. Parallel. Like in the marriage covenant, like hmm. the wife is to submit herself to her husband. But if she, if she bolts against that, you know what I mean? Then there's going to be real discord and that's not going to, it's not going to go well if she doesn't just... Hmm learn what her place is and in learning her place there's a blessing in that yeah but you have to have the right attitude you know what i mean that's a good application yeah and it takes humility to take that subservient right. place because in um, yourself you think well no i don't want to you know or you might think i don't want to have that place yeah. i want to i know just as well as like Edom might have said, well, our prophets are just as good as theirs. Yeah. You know, I know just as good. I know better than my husband. 
you know. But where the Lord gives a, a position, he also gives an equipping. Mm -hmm. So, and then it takes humility to just, okay. Or even like just submitting to the leadership of the Holy Spirit, right? Like oh, not having sure. your own yeah. thought, but mm -hmm. sacrificing Same, that. Yeah. And yeah. like submitting to the leadership of the Lord instead of something. Your own way or. Yeah. Or how about a pastor? There could be a pastor who is gifted and called and able to find the word of God for a people. But let's say he only has a, a high school education. And in that same church, there could be really smart people, you yeah. know, that have natural intelligence and That's have been right. to college yes. and all these different things. Yeah. But they're not equipped with the spiritual yes. perception he has. And they have to submit under that leadership. Humble. Yeah. Because yeah. mm -hmm. spiritual insight's a, a different thing. You don't study your right. way into that. That's mm -hmm. something the Lord gives. Yeah. I think that's one of the key words out there is humble, right? If you yes. had humbled themselves and said, you know, let us come that way that you're, you've found, you know. Mm hmm. Mm -hmm. Same thing for all of these mm -hmm. examples. Yeah. Really yeah. And they could have helped with the wall. Yeah. And they could have seen when they went back in Ezra or in Nehemiah 8, when they open up the the books mm -hmm. the, the, of Moses and the prophets, yeah. and they're reading them. Edom could have seen then. They could have had a, an aha moment like Israel did if they would have joined them. And they could have seen that they're supposed to be a part of it too. I sure hope some of them did. I, I just, mm -hmm. I think some of them did, but the nation didn't. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. Also, tell me why Brother Brown strove about the individual versus the organization. Hmm. So, right. The Catholic Church, uh, a rough organization to be a you know, leadership yeah. in, but the individuals within it, he always said, were good hearted people. You know? yeah. He's against the, the system. Yeah, he's against the system. So, yeah. Mm -hmm. Again, yep. nation versus individual is pretty important. And it was the system that was destroyed. Yeah. The nation was destroyed. But all those people, their gene pool is out here still somewhere. Mm -hmm. You know, they didn't, the people weren't annihilated, but the nation was. Are they still <laughs> I don't know where they went. You know, they're scattered throughout the world. They're just not a unified people anymore. Yeah, but the system is gone. There is no... But that spirit that was on them is still here. Like you said, it's the spirit of Cain. It's still here. Yep, that spirit of, I just don't want to do it that way. Even when God makes it clear, that's the way of blessing. Yeah. Question. Uh, does that, is there any way that can be serpent seed because of like, even though they're Cain, um, you said the spirit of Cain, right? So that Cain have already kind of some things, but like, yeah. I always thought serpent seed was kind of like not really someone pinching, like the, like the uh, Canaanites and the people of Edom, they had their inheritance, right? So they were kind of like, in a way, a part Christian, you know, they're not part nation, of, right? But, yeah. but then also, Brother Brown would say that the, sometimes the worst ones are the ones that are close to the mm. truth, and they're the, the real religious ones, they're the worst ones, right? Because mm. just the people that don't even know about God, they're just whatever, right? But Mm. You know, Christians the were the closest to mm. the, true, the true church, and they were the closest to mm -hmm. Satan was the closest to Jesus, right? Saying, I shall ascend, and kind of being right there. So, right. you know, like, is that the worst place to be? I don't know. But like, it might be. I mean, there's other nations that are, Egypt is still, that's an ancient nation. Mm -hmm. They weren't destroyed, but they weren't called to do what yeah. Edom was called to do. So... But it kind of reminds me of who made that quote. It's it's easier to uh, to love the unbeliever than it is to love the brother who slightly disagrees with you. <laughs> brother Nathan Brown. <laughs> yeah. And Esau and Jacob, you know, just uh, couldn't couldn't work it out. That spirit went right through. Yeah. All right. Well, we did pretty good for starting late. We started 10 minutes late and went 10 minutes over. So not too bad. Excellent comments. Thank you for being patient with the Bible study that had a lot of history and a lot of things that are hard to explain. But 
hopefully we won't read those first verses of Malachi the same after this context and put it into perspective for us. So, amen? Amen. Okay, and there is a, a little snack in there, I understand. And so, uh, let's just pray. Dear Lord, we just thank you for your word. I just really appreciate you and, and the things that you teach us here that are just nuggets just hidden in your word. If we can just get in and, and rely on you to bring them out for us with the help of the Holy Ghost and with the help of the message of the hour, which is such a light to us in this dark time. Lord, I just appreciate the people. Lord, give a, a blessing on each person that's here tonight and everyone that will perhaps hear this little Bible study in the future. Thank you for the snack that's been prepared. Please give us safety on the way home. Yes, Lord. In Jesus Christ's name, amen.